Thanks, Keith. Um, as you said, I'm Daniel Pest. I'm ICT advisor for the British Museum. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the Fourth Antiquity Scheme website I've been running for 10 years now, and a little bit of history about other things that I'm up to. Uh, if you've got any questions, talk to me afterwards. And the slides are actually online now as well. If anyone's on Twitter, they can find out where these are. So I'm going to start with 2001. And many of you might remember the Fourth Antiquity Scheme back there. It looked pretty awful. This is uh, the old website, how it used to look. Uh, this comes back from the Wayback Machine. You can actually find snapshots of my website online in the Internet Archive. This just shows you what it used to look like. In 2003, we had Oxford Art Digital build us a website. It cost quite a lot of money. £150,000 is a lot of money, even now. It looked pretty old school web in its function. And then in 2007, after they went bust, I implemented all the technology. <coughs> I've recently been joined by Mary Chester Cadwell from Norfolk HDR. She's with me for six months. And one of the big problems for the Port Antiquity Scheme is ICT risk. If I was doing all the implementation, if I decided to leave or something happened to me, what would happen with the scheme's infrastructure? So Kate Clark identified this back in 2008, and we did nothing about it until 2014. So we should have done something. We didn't. And this is what it looks like now. So it's, it's changed substantially. It's got lots of new features. I'm going to show you some of these features that I'm working on now and the technology base that we're actually using. So <laughs> this slide might be quite scary to a lot of you. I'm using a lot of different technologies. Paul referred to some of these. Now, they're all open source. They're all free. I do not pay a single penny for license for these. I don't pay any money for developing the website. The latest iteration costs nothing apart from my salary. So we've saved lots of money in the long term compared to how much we're paying for Oxford Digital to keep building websites for us. So there's the, the cat up there. I've got a cat into my talk. That's the uh, Tomcat. I use PHP with my programming language, and I use Python for munching data around. And these are the three pillars of actually what I'm up to now. I work on open source technology. I put our data out under a Creative Commons license, and we try and be open data as much as we can. And this is a problem for some of the organizations that might be in the room, open data. How can you do that when your institution is telling you you must make money from the information? I took our non-commercial clause off three years ago, and our usage has been driven through the roof by doing this. I'm going to show you some stats that show you how much we're using our website now. So this is my annual budget, £5,000. Now this is actually paying for the servers to actually run. I have to pay some money out, but actually just pays for the infrastructure. So I've got five servers, they're based in Reading. I pay for them to be on 24-7 every day of the year. So it's actually quite cheap to run that sort of uh, hardware. Five servers at £5,000 is nothing really in the big scheme of things. This is how many contributors we now have for the Port Antiquity Scheme. 24,000. That's not very many when you think about the population of this country. 66 million people. But we've got 24,000 people wanting to come forward and contribute data to the Port Antiquity Scheme. We have nearly a million objects online now. That's a lot of data to play with. It's almost verging on big data, but not quite there yet. Big data is much bigger than this, but we keep pushing this paradigm out that big data is large like this. It's not. We can do lots more with data. I have 954,000 objects but I have 16 million records in the database of different actions, what people are doing. Now, that's big data. You can do lots of interesting text mining with that data and find out what people's voices are saying over time. Who are the people writing things about what we're up to? I'm just going to show you a few figures about visitor numbers. So this is back in 2003 when Oxford Art Digital built our database. 10,000 people a year used our website. That's really, really small. In 2006, just before they went bust, we went up to 165,000 people a year using our website. It's the same budget as we had before, but different technologies started to be employed. And in 2011, we're up to nearly half a million. This is starting to get a reasonable figure. Still not really penetrated the larger world. And in 2012, we broke half a million. Same again last year. And this year, we're looking at about 600,000 people, I think, looking at projections. And this is the interesting thing. We're collating the world's data, just as you all are as her heritage professionals. But people are starting to use our data for performing their own research. We now have 415 research projects actually using our data that we catalogue. On our website, I keep a record of who's using our data and what for. I ask them to submit abstract and referee, and I check them out, find out whether the research is bona fide, and then they get access. So Chris mentioned earlier that we provide them with data. So I think that's the project using our data in the biggest style. And I've just given Chris a, a huge update, Chris Green, of data, and I think he's been a bit worried about how much data has shifted across the country. We have... 604 people putting data into our system. That's 604 people who can make errors. So error margin is huge. And I found out that lots of people can't read maps. 
they get the wrong grid square. So they get the east and northing slightly right, but it's still looking in the wrong place. But now that computer technology has come along, it makes it much easier for people to map grid references using different technology. That's just about the multivocal data capture. We have 6,700 users who actually use our system now. We estimate there's about 10,000 people out there who message detect. So you could be a bit blase and say 6 to 7% of them are using our database and actually logging in to see their finds, but they're not. This is members of the community, this is research professionals. And this figure is a bit staggering. Apparently, I have 8.6 million pages on our website. I'm sure I don't have that many physical web pages. I have lots of RDF views, I have lots of XML, and Google indexes all of those. So we have high visibility. When you do a search for Roman coins, we come up near the top. You can actually put finds numbers into Google and they come up as a top result now as well. And data's being captured in real time. So this is a map from yesterday afternoon. And the map on the left view shows dots on the map where objects are being created. You can actually see an audit log as well that tells you when the record was created. So you can see in real time when data's going on. So if someone creates a record on our system and it can be instantly available to the public, and we're doing that nationally, so Paul and I were talking earlier about how HER should really be one national system. Paul thinks they should be integrated in different ways. But you could record this all this information online and you could see what's going on and interrogate them all in one place. And this works really well for Port Antiquities. It might not work for the HER, it's one way you could do things. And the map on the right just shows you where coins have been found in this country. And Wales, sorry, I should say Wales as well. And I've got multiple formats. There's Lorna looking at this, this slide. There's one thing that she really hates and that's QR codes. But I think they can be used in a very good way when it comes to archaeological data. Whenever we print off a record, every record has a QR code attached to it. And you can give that to the finder and they can stick it on a finds bag. And you can actually use that code to find out where the URL is and they can go to it. I have data in XML format. This is my uh, standard on the right hand side. I have data in JSON. I have data in RDF. I have it in CSV. Lots of other formats that you can download. And people keep saying to me, let's build an app for your website. But what's the point? It's just an expensive digital silo. You're pushing data into that. You've got to keep going back and updating it. I can't afford to do that. The return on investment is so negligible. And I think Lorna's found this in her research, which has been asking heritage societies and archaeologists whether apps should be used. And I think she tweeted yesterday that there's no real appetite for them. And do we know audiences? Am I right there, Lorna? Yeah. So what I decided to do instead was mobile optimise our website using Bootstrap, which is a CSS framework that's free. Anyone can download this. And as you can see, it works. You can even get maps to work. You can zoom around and you can pan and zoom in. There are a few problems, but we're ironing those out now. And we started to recycle data in various different ways. So we just had a little bit of uh, background to Seneschal. I'm using that data, as you just found out. I'm also using ordnance survey data. So Paul mentioned data sets that I could actually link to and interrogate at the same time. I can also go off and find out information from the ONS. So I can find out what people are earning in that district what the interest that might be. All this stuff that's been collated is a bit scary in some ways. And these are just some examples of where I'm using the ordnance survey data. So every find spot, as Paul said, has got strings of text attached to them, identifying the parish, district, region, the county. But these link off to URIs, which can give you far more information back. So I can get the grid reference for the centre of that parish, or the centre of that county, or the centre of that region, and tell people what they would be. Sometimes someone comes forward without a grid reference for a find. I can centre it in a parish and tell people it's centred on a parish just from using a URI. And we also link off to all these other resources. So I link to resources like Pleiades and Numisma. This is a coin system and a Roman gazetteer. I link off to DBpedia, so I pull back information relating to kings. You gave a very good example earlier. And I use Viaf as well. So there's always identifiers out there you can pull extra information from. But most people, when you go to hack days, say, I don't want to play with RDF. It's too complex to play with. They just want your data. So I do a dump every night of data on, into CSV, and that goes into Amazon Web Services. All our data can be queried using the solar syntax in the search engine, which you're probably not familiar with, but if you do a search on our website, some help to how to do this. And we replicate our servers across five different servers. We have five indexes, so we're optimizing what we're actually up to. The images are backed up to the cloud every night. I pay about £20 a month out of my own pocket to support the scheme to back up the data because I'm worried about data failure. My servers are all in the same place. So if they go off, offline because of a natural disaster, at least I've got to back up somewhere else. And we have lots of technology partnership projects going on at the moment with AHRC funding, uh, Leverhulme Trust, and we work with Oxford as well quite extensively. So I'm going to give you some examples now of what we're doing. So this is just data transfer. 
I've recently had funding with uh, Dan Hicks and Pitt Rivers Museum, where we're going to try and transfer data from the museum into our data set, and then onto the historic environment records, where you download data from us, you get their data at the same time. This is a pilot project, and we've got £29,000 to do this. And if it works, we can try and do it with other museums as well. We also dump data out into Plagios, which Leaf mentioned earlier, I think. So every night we produce a dump of data, and I think that goes in about once a month to your system. And we try and transfer data to HRs, but this isn't always successful. We know there's errors in the data, and some HRs have a real problem actually ingesting our data. There's not enough man time, and this is one of the things I think keeps coming out today, time. We don't have time to do all this work, and I'm always struggling with time to do the work that I'm trying to do. So people keep saying, have you built this feature yet? I'm still trying to do some of the other ones that people asked for in the past. So Nick emailed me last week asking if there's a web feature service. I'd love there to be one, but I just haven't got time to implement it at the moment. Maybe next year. Then we've got some other things that have gone online recently. Visualizations are all the rage now. So I've got some funding from the HRC, just £5,000 to build this application with a company called Trace Media. And a chap called Gavin Bailey met me at a Wikipedia conference when I was talking about us sharing data with Wikipedia. He came up to me after and said, I'd love to work with your data, because archaeology is structured, it's interesting, there's time, there's people attached. And so he built this visualisation for us. This shows you where the mints are for Roman coins, or any other type of coin. And you click on a mint, and it shows you where the point, uh, coins have been found in the UK. And we're now working in crowdsourcing as well. Some of you might have heard of this new project I've launched recently with Andy Bevan of UCL. This is Micropath. We're trying some different techniques out. We're looking at crowdsourcing as, as an academic exercise to see whether people are actually interested in doing crowdsourcing work. So we've taken 30,000 index cards from the British Museum Bronze Age Archive, and we're scanning them on a high-speed scanner in the basement of our offices at the moment. We've done 10,000 so far. And these are going online, and we're hoping people might transcribe them for us. They've never been seen before by the public, so it's a resource that it could actually take all of the resource themselves and just do it selfishly, or they could contribute to human knowledge by doing it for everyone. We also do some 3D modelling. I'll come back to the 3D modelling. Um, we're also going to look at crowdfunding as well. Now, crowdfunding's possibly a concept that won't actually work in archaeology. Is there enough money to support what's going on? So we're looking at very small funding ideas. Someone might want £1,000 to do some archaeological research, and they can bid for it on this site. So they put up a video of what they want to do, and a bit of background information. And then the public might fund them. Whether it happens or not is a different matter. And this goes live next month, we hope. Yeah, I'll finish. And this is an example of a 3D model that's been done by co-production. So the public were asked to draw polygons around these axe photos. This was actually produced by 20 photos being done by the public, and we did this as our first model. We're actually hoping to do the 3D printer hoard at the British Museum at a children's event, so they can actually handle these objects. And we're also looking at other technology as well. We're doing video conferencing with schools based around the Froom Horde. This is my wife sitting in the students' room for Prehistory and Europe as the children see it. We've got a backdrop of her with the video equipment. She's running this session. It's run for the first time last month, and it's been quite successful. So we're going to offer this in a, a greater audience, hopefully, if more schools sign up to it. And we also use social media to try and push our message out. Now, Lauren's PhD, which is forthcoming, has looked at social media use in archaeology a lot. It's not a silver bullet for people to communicate with the public. I've just marked a dissertation for UCL, which actually says the opposite to what Lauren has found out. And they see social media being this really good thing that you can communicate with a new public. Is the appetite there? I'm not really sure it is in a great scale. There's no really big archaeological followings out there. When you look at celebrities who've got 16 million followers or 1.6 million followers, are we going to actually penetrate to a large audience using social media? But we've been using these tools for quite a while now. So we've been blogging since 2007. But that's currently offline because one of my servers broke. Um, we use Flickr for a very long time as well. We dis disseminate our images on there. So I put up the pictures of Staffordshire Hall the day it broke, and a quarter of a million people viewed those images in one day, which is quite a good figure. We use Twitter, but not very extensively because I don't have time to do it for that. I do it for myself far more than I do for work. I use Facebook for work as well, but also not as much as I do for myself. And I'm supporting others as well. So there's one project that some of you might have heard of, which is Day of Archaeology, which I promised the Lorna that I'd mention today. Um, we give them service space as our sponsorship. And I also provide service space to the uh, Palace of Exploration Fund, which I was a trustee for, but I'm not anymore. And also for the Royal Numismatic Society. So I'm very willing to offer service space on our servers, because they've got two terabytes sitting there with nothing going on. 
So if anyone does need some help, do come talk to me afterwards. And that's the end. Thank you very much.